Oh, there's something stirring in here. Come on, tell God I need you today. I need you more than I needed you yesterday. Maybe it's the arrogance of our youth. In our young years, we feel like we can just do whatever. We can do anything. But the older and the more wise you get, the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When you recognize the need for God and who he is and what he's done for you, that's when wisdom begins. And this song says, hallelujah, you have won the victory. You've won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen king and you're seated in majesty. Don't you know that Christians, we are unique in the way, we are unique in the way that our founder, Jesus the Christ, died for us and then rose again. Buddhists cannot say that. They can't say that about Buddha. Muslims cannot say that about, about Muhammad. They can't say that Muhammad died and rose again. We are the only ones that says that our, our founder, the person we follow, died for me, but then he rose again. That's what separates us. And if he can raise from the dead with all power in his hands, and if I'm connected to him, I'm connected to all the power that I need. Won't you just lift your hands and say, God, I need you. I need some of that power, some of that resurrection power. My marriage ain't so good right now, God. My body's starting to break down on me. I need some of that resurrection power. I got a sick loved one that I'm trying to care for. I got, I got children that I'm trying to make a way for. I'm a single mother. God, I need some of that power that you talk about, that you said, that you had in your hand when you got up out of the grave. Come on, lift those hands and tell him. Take a minute. Just spend a minute with God and tell him, I need you, God. I need you. Come on, be honest with him today. Come on, be honest with him today.
victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. And death could not hold you down. Would you pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and honor you, God. We adore you. We thank you so much, God, for your goodness and your kindness and your love toward us. God, in this moment, God, I pray that you hide me behind the cross, that you would, God, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Preach through my mouth, Father. Let no one see me, but let them see you in me, Father. And God, I'm praying today that if there's a person under the sound of my voice that needs to receive Christ into their life, that today, that God, they would recognize that Jesus is the way. I pray today, God, that no one would leave the same way that they came. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to call your attention to the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. The gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Today, I want to push pause just to reflect on the mission of the church. So Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to begin reading at verse 18 down through verse 20. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. And again, today I'm just talking. I'm not trying to shout you. I'm not trying to make you swing from the chandeliers. But I'm just trying to make sure that we all understand what the mission of the church is. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18, I'm reading from the New International Version. And it reads, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. You may be seated. In the presence of the Lord. Again, we're talking about the mission of the church. I had been reading a research article that was produced by Pew, and it talked about how Christianity is declining in America. Ten years ago, 77% of adults in this country professed to be Christians. Now, as it stands today, ten years later, only about 65% of adults profess to be Christians. There are 23 million more adults in the country today than there were 10 years ago, but there are 12 million, 12 million less Christians today than there were 10 years ago. And, if, and people are dropping out of church left and right. If you want to know why our churches are not packed and why our churches are not filled, it's because people are dropping out of church, they're leaving Christianity, or they're just declaring that they were never a Christian to begin with, or even acknowledging Christ to begin with. And all of this presents an opportunity for the church, an opportunity that the church has had since its inception. And that is to fulfill the mission that the Lord has given to us. And by the way, let me just say parenthetically that Mount Pleasant is 126 years old. But Mount Pleasant is not the church. Mount Pleasant is a part of the church. Mount Pleasant uh, is a part of the church because the church is nearly 2,000 years old. Jesus instituted the church in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 when Peter made that confession of faith and said that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Christ responded and said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then in Acts chapter 2, we see the inauguration of the church where the Holy Spirit descended upon 120 believers in the upper room and there were uh, cloven tongues of fire that rested upon them. They all spoke in different languages as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And from that day until now, the church has been established. And every new organization, every new church or new congregation that comes into existence is not a new church. It's just a new part of the church. Just like Walmart. When Walmart moves into a neighborhood, that's not a new business being started. That's just a new location of an existing business that's been around for a while. 
And even when Mount Pleasant was started 126 years ago, it wasn't a new church. It was a new part of the church, a new part of God's community coming together. And the church has always had a mission statement. And Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 is that mission statement. It does not matter how fanciful churches describe their mission. If the essence of their mission statement veers away from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, then I, I would have to say that that particular congregation is off course because Jesus has given us the mandate for what we are supposed to do. Everybody wants the church to be everything but what the church was put in place to be. I can't get no help in here at the 1030 service. So what I want us to do is look at Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 to see what Jesus intended for us to do as the church. It starts off in verse 18. Jesus, the Bible says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is after the resurrection. Jesus has gone to Golgotha. He has hung, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary. He has been resurrected, been raised from the grave. He has, and this is right before he's about to ascend to heaven and take his seat at the right hand of the Father. The last thing he said before he left, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And if anybody has earned the right to have all authority in heaven and on earth, it's Jesus. Jesus Christ because of what he did for you and I because y'all none of us would have went to the cross for somebody else especially when you know you were in the right and they were in the wrong but that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I so if anybody deserves to have all that authority it is the Lord himself and watch this Jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven because whatever you need out of heaven, you're going to have to get it from Jesus. If you need joy, you're going to have to get it from the Lord. If, if, if you need peace, you're going to have to give it, get it from the Lord. Whatever you need out of heaven, you got to get it from Jesus. Why? Because all authority has been given to him in heaven wait a minute not just in heaven but whatever you need on earth you got to get it from the Lord if you need a job he'll be the one to open a door for you if you need healing he'll be the one that'll do that for you as well y'all eat everything you and I need comes from Jesus because all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth even people who are not saved who are not believers need to recognize that their blessings come from the Lord they might not know it comes from the Lord because they don't know him but if there's anything good that's happening in your life that you are not a believer you need to understand that it was the Lord that made that happen for you some of us who are believers now, thank you, Holy Spirit. Some of us who are believers now, we can look back over our lives at a time when we were not believers. And now that we are believers, we can look back and see the hand of God that was on us even before we became believers. That God's hands was on us, taking care of us when we were foolish and we were staying out all night at the clubs and we were getting drunk and we were taking all kinds of substances in our bodies and we were laying up with folk that we weren't married to and doing all kinds of things we shouldn't have been doing with people we didn't hardly even know but the reason we're sitting here today disease free the reason we're sitting here today with strength and health in our body the reason we're sitting here today and we have not been destroyed is because even before we gave our life to Jesus he had his hands on us oh I said I wasn't going to pray but somebody ought to say thank you right there somebody ought to give God praise right there because God kept you even when you didn't know any better do I have a witness in here Amen. Amen. all right let me come back down and just teach because that's all I'm trying to do today is just teach Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me watch this 
He says that because he's talking about control. Now he gets to a command. This command is what you and I should be doing from now until the Lord comes back. There is, in verse 19, one command that has three supporting actions. There's only one thing the Lord told us to do. One command with three supporting actions. The command in verse 19 is not to go, even though that sounds like a command. The command in verse 19 is not to baptize, even though that sounds like a command. The command in verse 19 is not to teach, even though that sounds like a command. The one command, the one thing Jesus told us to do in verse 19 is to make disciples. That's what the church is supposed to do. We are supposed to make disciples. People in the 21st century want the church to be everything but the church. We want the church to be a school for the public school system. We want the church to be a social service agency. We want the church to be this type of group and that type of group. But the one thing Jesus told us to do is the one thing that we are getting away from doing, and that is to make disciples. We got people nowadays that get mad with the church when the church doesn't take action on this issue and take action on that issue and don't do this and don't do that when you don't when we don't understand watch this that if we do the one thing Jesus told us to do that will address every issue that we have going on in our communities right now somebody else said pastor you got to help me to understand how does that happen well let me help you a disciple is a student a follower of the ways and teachings of Christ that's what a disciple is. A disciple is a student of the ways and teachings of Christ. That's what a disciple is, right? Now, stay with me for a moment. A person comes through those doors. They hear the gospel. They get saved. We start the work of teaching and making disciples. And they start learning about the ways of Christ. Well, the ways of Christ is going to teach that person to be kind and to be loving. The ways of Christ is going to teach that person to be forgiving of folk when they wrong you. Right. The ways of Christ is going to teach that person to defend the rights of the poor. The ways of Christ is going to teach that person to walk with integrity. Now watch this. That's one person. Imagine that there was a whole city that was following the ways of Christ. Imagine that the entire state of Indiana was made up of Christian disciples that were following the ways and teachings of Christ. Imagine that our entire country was made up of folk who were following the ways and teachings of Christ. What would our murder rate be in this country if we had that many Christian disciples following the ways and teachings of Christ? What would the divorce rate be if we had that many people following the ways and the teachings of Christ? The, the teachers in Indiana wouldn't have to march downtown to try to get politicians to give them more money. Why? Because if we had more disciples in the government, more disciples in our communities, they would already know that's a justice issue and we need to pay people fair wages. Y'all, when you make disciples, you are addressing every issue that we are facing in our community that's what the work of the church is all about it's making disciples our crime rates would come down we wouldn't have a government starting wars all over the place I might lose a member today <laughs> if we made disciples for Christ that's the work of the church. Nobody asks other institutions to change their purpose and their mission, but we ask the church to change its purpose and mission 
to be everything but what the church was put in place. You don't go to a, a public school and ask them to be a hospital. You don't go to a hospital and ask them to be a youth center. You don't go to a club and ask them to be an education facility. But we all come to the church and tell the church, we need you to be a youth center, a social service agency, a hospital, a school. We need you to be everything but what you were put here to do. Here it is, Jesus says, make disciples. And there's three ways to do that. Very simple things, but they may not be easy. He gives us three ways to do that here in verse 19. He says, this is what you do to make a disciple. First thing, you have to go. And in the literal Greek text, this literally is not a command. It is a supporting action. It means literally as you go. In other words, the church does not have to create special evangelism programs to get folk to go knock on doors and canvas neighborhoods. You don't have to take time out of your regular schedule to obey this. Jesus says, as you go. In other words, wherever you go, as you go, what you ought to do is take the gospel with you and be ready to share it when you encounter somebody who do not know the Lord. If you need an acronym for go, here it is, get out. G-O, get out. Get out of the four walls. Get out of your house. Get out of your closet and just go. And wherever you go, you need the gospel in your heart and be ready to share it with anyone that will give you an opportunity to share the gospel. So when you go to the lunch table after, after church and you're at the restaurant eating today, have the gospel in your heart and be ready to share it with that waitress, with that waiter, with the couple across the table at another table from you and be ready to share it. You don't have to take time out of your schedule and set up a special program. It's as you go. When you go to class, when you go to work, when you go to the laundromat, when you stop at the gas station, as now one of the reasons why some of us don't share the gospel, it could be because we don't know the gospel. We don't know it. If I ask all of y'all in here who say you are a Christian to raise your hand, I'm sure over 90% of the folk in this room would raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But over 90% of the folk in this room raise your hand and say, I'm a Christian. But I've asked people who believe that they are a Christian before, how do you know you are a Christian? And you'll be surprised at some of the answers that I get from people that have been in the church for a long time. People will tell me stuff like, I know I'm a Christian because I've been baptized. That does not make you a Christian. I know I'm a Christian because I go to church on a regular basis. That does not make you a Christian. I know I'm a Christian because I don't smoke no more. I don't curse no more. I don't go to the club no more. That still does not make you a Christian because you can get baptized and go down a center and come up a wet center without ever with net, without having been changed at all. Just because you've been baptized, that doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you come to church, that does not make you a Christian. Y'all, the devil is in church right now. You need to know that Satan is up in here right now. Everybody, that's, don't look at nobody. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. But somebody in here don't know Jesus, but they perpetrating just like they're Christian. You are a Christian not because of anything you have ever done in your life. You cannot be good enough to earn God's favor and earn God's salvation. Watch this. Watch this. Whatever age you are right now, whatever age you are right now, right? Let's just say from this point forward until the day you die, you never commit another sin. You live perfect from now until the day you die. Do you know? You've already done enough to disqualify you from God's grace and God's salvation. Watch this, because the Bible tells us even our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. You and I 
The only way we become a Christian, let me tell you what the gospel is. I'm going to give it to you in three simple points, A, B, and C. You can remember it as simple as A, B, and C. Here's how you become a Christian. Number one, you have to A, admit that you are a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You got to admit that you are a sinner. Stop walking around here making everybody think you've been holy since the day you were born. We know you jacked up and messed up from the floor up. You just got to be honest with yourself because God already knows you are a sinner. And here is what sin is. Whatever God's standard is, you've missed that mark. So if God says be truthful, all of us have told a lie. We've missed that mark. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A, admit you are a sinner. B, believe that God raised you. Jesus from the dead. Believe that Jesus is Lord. You got to believe that in your heart, but you can't just stop at admitting and believing. You got to go further and do letter C, which is confess. You admit, you believe, watch this, and you confess that Jesus is Lord. You got to personally invite Christ into your heart to be saved. And if you've never confessed, if all you've done is admit and believe, you are not saved. Because it's not just belief, but it's your confession of that belief that brings salvation into your life. Y'all, the Bible says that even the devil believes and tremble. If all you do is believe that Jesus is Lord, you are, you are not doing anything that the devil doesn't do. You got to go beyond that because one thing devil can't do is confess a hope in Jesus Christ and call upon his name. You, that's the one thing the devil cannot do. And y'all, that is the gospel that you got to have in your heart when you go and be ready to share. Now, let me tell you something else about going. When you go, if you're going to be ready to share, you got to be willing to interact with people. What you cannot do is walk around town like this. Y'all know what this is, right? Most of us cannot put this down long enough to connect with anybody around us. We are glued to this. And y'all, I'm guilty too. Because when I go to restaurants and I go out to eat, if I go by myself and I'm sitting at the table, I don't want to look like I'm lonely. So, so I pull out my cell phone. I do what y'all do. I pull my cell phone out. And I, and I act like I got business going on. Looking at my cell phone. But you know what? There might be somebody sitting around me that God wants me to connect to so that I could share the gospel with them. You can't do that if your face is in this. And we have to learn how to put this down and we have to learn how to connect with folk around us. And you know there's a couple of simple ways to do that. Number one, make eye contact with folk. Number two, smile at folk. Some of y'all do not know what you look like when you are not smiling. You look like a soldier when you are not smiling. And you need to practice looking in the mirror and seeing yourself not smiling to know what, you, what impression you're giving off to somebody else. And you need to smile, which softens you and makes you look more approachable where people will be wanting and willing to talk to you. And you got to smile. Here's another thing I would encourage you to do when you go. Before you walk out of your door, and I promise you, I'm telling you something that I learned a long time ago. Before you walk out of your door, you should pray this simple prayer. You should pray, Lord, show me one person that I need to share the gospel with today. I want to challenge you to do that from now moving forward. Now, when you do pray that, you need to get prepared. Because the moment you do that, now you're all up in God's Kool-Aid. Because that's exactly what God's been wanting you to do all this time. And God's like, oh, yes, I got somebody now. They praying to ask me to show them somebody that need to hear the gospel. And watch what God does. I promise you, before the day is over, God would have connected you to somebody who needs to hear the gospel. Somebody, you need to pray. I prom I've been doing this uh, since um, I, I became a Christian. I've been praying that prayer. And every single time I pray it, it was without fail. I could be in a, at the gas station getting ready to check out. And somebody I connect with just by conversation. And then it leads to something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you pray that, it's going to happen for you. And you need to be ready to share 
Now watch this. Here's what you need to do when you go. After you go, the second step, here it is, to making a disciple is going. The first, uh, first is going. The second is baptizing. So after you go, then you have to, and you see somebody who comes to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, or you are able to lead somebody to Christ, then you bring them back to the church. Now you invite them to church so that they can start learning about the ways of Christ. They can start conforming their lives to the standard of the word of God. That's what we do on Sunday morning. That's why there's this space in service where we stop the worship, we stop the singing to hear the word because this is the primary purpose of the church is to explain the word of God to you so that you can know what God requires and leave and go do it. Y'all ain't saying amen to none of this. But this is some good teaching. Since y'all won't come to Bible study, I'm bringing Bible study to you. He says, you got to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going there. So you can tell your apostolic uh, 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 cousins that the pastor didn't even explain that to us today. Because, y'all, it doesn't matter whether you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or if somebody at your cousin church only baptized in Jesus' name. At the end of the day, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward transformation. When you get baptized, what you are saying is that when I go under the water, I have been just like Christ and I've died to myself I've died to my old life and I've been buried to who I used to be and when I come up from the water that's just like Christ I've been raised to a brand new life and I'm physically I'm visibly showing you outwardly what has happened to me already inwardly that I've been born again that I've been transformed that I've died to my old self and I've been raised to a brand new life and let me just pause and just ask do I have any born again folk in here anybody that's been baptized watch this here's the third thing you got to teach that's the primary purpose of the church is to teach that's why we have this Sunday service. That's why we have Bible study. That's why we have Sunday school. And so people can learn. Now watch this. For all of us, whether you are, you got the title teacher or not, Jesus says in verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Who? You. In other words, you cannot teach something that you yourself are not willing to follow. Let me say that again. You cannot teach something that you yourself are not willing to follow. Jesus says these commands are not just for them, therefore everyone, including you. So don't get up trying to tell other folk what to do and then you yourself are not trying to live by the very thing you are telling other people to do in their lives. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect at this. Y'all, I get up to you and tell you at times to forgive other folk and sometimes, y'all, I have trouble forgiving people myself. But I try and I pray and I eventually get to the point where I do forgive people because I'm not telling, Jesus isn't telling you to be perfect, but he's telling you to recognize that that command to forgive isn't just for them, it's for you as well. So don't start telling them to forgive and then you walking around with grudges in your heart and bitterness and unforgiveness in your soul. You got to learn to forgive as well and be honest with people. I try to be honest with y'all. I tell y'all when I'm struggling. I tell y'all that every now and then if you get me in the right circumstance and you get me in the right context and you're around me at the right time, you might hear a few choice words come out of my mouth. I'm still struggling. I'm still trying to get over some stuff. Y'all, Because, but before I got saved, y'all, you got to understand I was deep into the world, y'all. I was, I was a good little cusser in the world. So now that I'm a born again and I love the Lord, I've all but all, almost worked it all out of my system. But there's a, a moment. Ain't nobody helping me. There's an opportunity. Say the wrong thing when I'm in my flesh. And just know, I told you here first. 
So don't drop out of church talking about, I can't sit under that pastor. He carnal. He don't, he don't follow the word of God. No, I do follow the word of God. Not just not on that day. I was, I was that day right there. I just, I was, I, I was in my, I was in the flesh. I would have loved for the Lord to wait until I became perfect before he called me to preach. I would have loved for that. But God didn't wait for me to become perfect and get everything together and then say go preach. God took me while I was still kind of dirty, took me while I was still had some stuff going on in my life. He took me when I was still trifling and said, you know what? On, I can work with that. Go on, go on, get a microphone and tell these folk what I need for them. And y'all, you ain't got to sit there and look at me like that. Because if God waited until you became perfect before he used you or did anything with you, y'all, none of us would be in this church right now. But y'all, I don't know about you, but the reason I can praise God today is because God, every time I fell down, every time I did something wrong, God picked me up. God turned me around. God put my feet, I wish I had a witness in here, on solid ground. God forgave me. Yes. Yes. Y'all, God is so good with forgiveness that God doesn't just give you a second chance. Y'all, I blew my second chance the day after I got saved. I got saved when I was seven years old, and I blew my second chance. Can I tell you how good God is? We serve the kind of God that doesn't give you a second chance. This is what God does. He gives you another chance. And another chance. And another chance. Y'all gonna catch it in a minute. And another chance. And another chance. Here's what the Bible says. That God's mercies are new every morning. Here's the last thing I want to share with you. That, that Jesus lays out the mission that here's what we ought to do. Make disciples. We do that when we go. We do that when we baptize. We do that when we teach. Then Jesus concludes with a promise. He says, I, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He concludes with a promise. Now watch this. This is going to really, it, it messed me up. It may not do nothing for you, but it messed me up. Jesus just connected his presence to the pursuit of this mission. So that if you are not pursuing the mission in verse 18, you can't claim the promise in verse 20. If you're not doing verse 19, then you can't claim the promise in verse 20. Y'all, there is a level of God's presence that you will never experience until you are serving him and doing what he's called you to do. Even right now, while I'm standing up here preaching the word of God, I feel the spirit of God all over me. Because whenever you are serving God, whenever you are in the middle of God's will, pursuing Doing God's mission, God has promised a level of his presence to be there with you. And some of y'all can't even say amen because you've never served God, so you don't even know what I'm talking about. There's only a handful of you that know what I'm talking about because the presence of God is so indescribable when you are in his will that you really can't even explain it to people at times. That when you are in the will of God, God doesn't just leave you to go through that situation situation by yourself God says I'm going to be with you watch this and this is the part that I shouted on to the end of the age now let me tell you why I shouted on that because at the time that Jesus said this he's talking to his disciples and he's saying to his disciples I'm going to be with you to the end of the age wait a minute the end of the age we are still in this age the disciples died a long time ago. Every last one of them, they're all dead now. And Jesus said, while they were still living, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying here? That, that, that I'm not just going to be with you for the duration of your life. Y'all ain't getting this. He said, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. In other words, I'm going to be with you while you're living. 
going to be with you when you're on your deathbed. I'm going to be with you when you transition. I'm going to be with you when you arrive in heaven because I'm going to be with you all the way through. I'm going to be with you in every aspect of your life. Y'all, Jesus is a loyal Lord. He's the kind of Lord that once you have him on your side, you never have to worry about the Lord ever leaving you because the Lord will be there for you through every situation, through every circumstance, through everything you will ever go through. And somebody can testify that the Lord was with you when you got the job and the Lord was with you when you got fired. The Lord was with you when you got sick and the Lord was with you when you got well. The Lord was with you when you had money and the Lord was with you when you lost the, all the every money you piece of money you had. The Lord was with you when you were successful and the Lord was with you when you failed. The Lord was with you when you had friends and the Lord was with you when your friends walked out on you. I just want to know, do I got a witness in here that know that we serve a God that'll stay with you when everybody else turns their back on you, when all hope seems to be lost. We serve a God that'll be with you until the end. So you should be encouraged today. The old saints used to say, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. Because God will take care of you. I said I wasn't going to preach. But now I've messed around. And I got happy. Because when I started to think about all the things that I've been through in my life. When I think about uh, all the hell I've been through. Uh, when I think about uh, all the pain I've had. Uh, and I think about the fact uh, that God uh, has never left me. Uh, my soul uh, just got happy. Uh, my soul uh, started to cry out. Uh, Hallelujah. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, I just want to know, is there anybody here that can give God a praise? Because you know that God will be with you to the end. It does not matter what the devil tries to throw at you. God will be with you until the end. Y'all excuse me. It's the first Sunday of 2020 and I just had to look back over my life and say God thank you for keeping me in 2019 thank you for never leaving me do I have a witness here somebody shout yes shout yes shout yes Come on, all over the sanctuary, if you can stand, please stand all over the sanctuary. You know a friend better than Jesus? I would love to meet your friend that's better than Jesus. There's not a friend like him. There's nobody like him, as a matter of fact. We want you to worship with us today. We want you to worship with us today. This song says, you're all I need. How many of you know that God is really all that we need? You don't need money. You don't need friends. Well, you do, but what you really need is God, because everything you need is in him. So if you get him, you have everything you need. Will you clap your hands on us like this? You're all I need. Every breath you breathe through me. You're all I need. Let your rivers flow through me. Come on, sing it. I need. 
Come on, sing that with us. You're all I need. there for us when we have no one else there for us. God who has saved us, God we just want to acknowledge who you are in our lives. We want to acknowledge what you do in our lives. Father God you are worthy of all of the praise from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. God you are worthy of all of our praise. Father God we want to thank you for all that you've done for us. We want to thank you for waking us up this morning. Father God, sometimes we take that for granted, but not everybody wakes up in the morning. Father God, we want to thank you for starting us on our way, giving us the right mind, giving us clothes to put on our backs, giving us what we need to make it through the day. Father God, giving us what we need to make it through the week. 
Lord, we know that some weeks are very hard to make it through. But Father God, we know that every step of the way that you are with us. We know that every step of the way you are there to hold us, to guide us, to love us, and to just help us in all the things that we need help in. Father God, we have some heavy hearts here today. Father God, I know that as praises go up and blessings come down and we have the, the expressions of joy going on, Father God, let us not forget those who are hurting. Let us not forget those under the sound of my voice that are grieving a loss of a loved one, who are worried or anxious about or concerned about a loved one. Father God, I want to pray for those who may be struggling financially. Father God, I want to pray for those and lift up those families that may be struggling. Father God, sometimes, Lord, the burden gets heavy. It gets hard to walk. It gets hard to keep on going. But God, let us always remember, let us always remember that you are there for us and that you have us. Father God, those with heavy hearts, Lord, I pray you wrap your loving arms of protection around them. Lord, whisper sweet nothings in their ear. Lord, let them know that you're there and that you're always there and that they can always rely on you. Father God, I just pray that you just bless them. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Father God, I pray that and just want to thank you for all the things and all the blessings you've given to us. Father God, even the things that we're not even deserving of. Lord, we know that your grace and your mercy follows us all the days of our lives. And we couldn't thank you enough for it. Lord, if we had a thousand tongues, we couldn't thank you enough for all your grace and your mercy, all those things that we don't deserve. Lord, I pray, Father God, that you just bless the service as we go further. Uh, I pray that you bless our pastor as he's traveling. Lord, I pray that you bless the man of God, Pastor Wyatt, as he comes forward to deliver the word of God. Let him deep down in your treasures, Lord, to let us know what thus saith the Lord. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Change us, Lord. And get us ready for next week. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen, amen.